My name is Avais Mohammed. I'm working for a think tank called British Future and an organisation called New Horizons in British Islam. And I was here to talk about my HLF funded project. It's called uh, An Unknown, Unknown and Untold, the story of Britain, Britain's World War I Muslim soldiers. When we talk about motivations and things like experiences of the soldiers, um, there's no single story. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that. As well as having the Brighton Pavilion opened up and become uh, a hospital for the Indian soldiers who were, who were wounded on the Western Front, similarly we had the Kitchen Hospital, um, which was uh, pretty much run like a, like a prison camp. So much so that one of the Indian soldiers tried to assassinate the general who was looking after it. Um, white nurses weren't allowed to interact with the Indians for fear of relationships emerging and barbed wire was around the pavilion, you know, so it's both existed. Similarly with motivations, you have people who wanted the adventure, who thought they were serving king and country and thought that was the right thing to do, um, who thought that Germans needed defeating and thought that that was the right thing to do. Some people fought because they wanted to, uh, they, they fought for the adventure, they fought for the prestige perhaps, for the pride, uh, for the pride of their community and their families. Um, and others were forced into it. Um, you, so you, at one extreme you've got people who felt as though they were uh, emboldening the name of their clan and of their tribe and their religion perhaps. And on another extent you had people whose you know, w women and children were literally kidnapped by General Dwyer to force the men to go and, and, uh, and, and recruit. And also there was this ghost of independence that was lurking in the horizon um, and the promise of it which also uh, was a reason for some people um, re enlisting, um, although that wasn't realised. What is it being the first time that Indians met with so many Europeans and vice versa? It's also the first time that war was mechanised for people who just got used to fighting with rifles. Um, you know, over the course of a century or whatever. Suddenly we've got cannons, we've got, you know, U-boats, we've got chemical warfare for the very first time, and we've got uh, warplanes. So this is war on a whole other level that must have felt like the apocalypse, you know, must have felt like the worst that human beings could possibly do to each other. Our hope and what we're discovering is that this, by pro uh, promoting this information, that 400,000 Indian Muslims fought for Britain in the First World War. It's, pri it's you know, obviously giving British Muslims a greater sense of claim to this country and allowing them to feel more British than they otherwise have been allowed to feel, perhaps. Um, and at the same time, it's, it's, we're finding that it broadens the definitions of what it means to be British amongst broader society. Um, so amongst, you know, Middle England and um, the white mainstream, um, we find that by disseminating this information and just talking about it and acknowledging it, the definitions of what it means to be British is also broadened and expanded. So it's, it's really a very powerful tool uh, and uh, a powerful story um, for contemporary Britain.